Hi, and welcome to the Elysian Symposium, a series where writers, thinkers, and friends imagine a more beautiful future. I'm Luke Ferris, and I'll be guiding our conversation for this episode, which will be on pro growth environmentalism. But before we dive into the discussion, I want to introduce the folks you'll be hearing from. Welcome, Jennifer and Malcolm, and as always, Al Griffin. Uh, folks, let's have you introduce yourselves. Malcolm, let's start with you. Sure. So I'm Malcolm Cochran. I, I work for humanprogress.org, which is a, a website dedicated to publicizing and investigating long-term improvements in human well-being. And then I also write a blog called Antheros, which is investigating a pro-human, pro-growth environmentalism. Thanks, Malcolm. Jennifer? Yeah, I'm Jennifer Morales. I work for a policy research center called the Center for Growth and Opportunity, and I manage our energy and environmental research. So a really broad area of topics, but, you know, energy policy, conservation, water, things like that. Thanks, Jennifer. And I feel like, Al, if you don't know who Al is, you should, but Al, can you share a little bit about yourself with the folks out there? Yes, um, I write The Elysian, Thinking Through a Better Future, which covers a lot of topics and has a a very general audience, but certainly pro-growth environmentalism is something that I want to talk about and something I wrote about this quarter. So I'm excited to talk to people more expert than me on the topic. Amazing. Jennifer, I want to start with you. Can you define pro-growth environmentalism? Yes, I can try at least. So to me, pro-growth environmentalism is just the idea that human progress does not have to come at the expense of the environment. So I also think connected to that is sort of an idea it's more widely accepted now that there's a moral imperative to protect the earth. And I agree with that. I think pro-growth environmentalism also considers a moral imperative to promote human flourishing alongside with the flourishing of the earth. I think that's a pretty good definition. Uh, I want to start with this question because I took a freshman environmental studies class, like maybe some folks listening and watching out there. And it was one of the most depressing things I was ever involved in. Um, I went away as a sprite 18 year old, just assuming there was doom and gloom. Um, and we were, and we should just at least enjoy the, t the five, 10, 20, 30 years we have left, but are there actual species of animals or environments that are doing better or doing well because of human action? I, I sort of, um, like to collect these as I go through the news because you see stories that pop up every once in a while that, that give you some hope. Um, I, I think the most interesting ones are species that that thrive because of things that you might think are bad. For example, flamingos. Um, there's a great story in Mumbai where flamingos are basically thriving in these environment in these wetland environments that have been polluted with with uh, with um, sewage and industrial waste that creates these cy cyanobacteria blooms, which flamingos like to eat. So it's actually what gives them their pink color. That's one example. Um, there's also things like uh, in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is one of those you know famous um, environmental boogeymen, you see an abundance of coastal species that don't usually live out there. So because of these semi-permanent structures that are now floating around, you have a new type of life and it's enhanced biodiversity. So it, it, I'm not saying that pollution is, is a good thing, but it helps to sort of rethink um, how human, rethink the notion that everything that humans, every human impact is, it has to be negative, right? Um, just because we've, you know, changed an ecosystem or even spoiled it somehow doesn't mean that everything that lives there is now losing. I feel like I always struggle with the idea that we, we come from, whether it's a, a news alert or discussions about the environment, we come from a human centric viewpoint and, and maybe we can't necessarily have a, a mule deer centric viewpoint or an octopus centric viewpoint because we, we, we don't have, we can't talk to any of them as, as a, as of now. Uh, do you think that's part of it is that we're coming from a human, human centric viewpoint and we think highly of ourselves, even in pollution and degradation of the earth? Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I, there's there's a there's a ton of, of different areas where we get our wires crossed, almost where we, we're sort of confusing our human concerns, which are about the environment, which, which are totally genuine. Obviously, we want to live in a beautiful environment, a clean environment for selfish reasons, but that doesn't always align perfectly with with the interests of wildlife. I think I think one great example is sort of this ideal of pastoralism. Uh, I think a lot of people want to live in a place with a with a beautiful landscape with these bucolic farms. Um, they want to go to a farmer's market. 
and this is all great, but that isn't necessarily the best thing for wildlife. Wildlife uh, doesn't tend to go well with agriculture at all. Um, they'd rather have a depopulated place where humans aren't there, just aren't, aren't even on the landscape in a lot of a lot of situations. I think you're right as well. I think that we have a very human centric view of even when we talk about the environment and our impact on other species. Um, and if you talk to me for any period of time about this, I'm probably going to wind up recommending a book by Emma Maris called Rambunctious Garden, where she talks a lot about 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 this idea that Malcolm mentioned of pastoralism or returning to a time when the environment was pristine. And she basically just uh, dismantles that idea and says there was never such a thing as pure pristine environment. Like if you even go back to pre-European contact in the U.S., Native Americans are always influencing the landscape and the environment. And while many of those impacts have been harmful, they aren't necessarily harmful. And she also says, you know, we should probably just acknowledge the fact that humans do have an impact and we have an impact globally. And we should work on mitigating and managing that impact instead of trying to return to a bygone area that wasn't actually as pristine as we think it was. I Okay, I think about this a lot because um, there is this kind of idealistic view that somehow we could have we could have this beautiful garden like world if we didn't live here. Um, but also, like, what would be the point if we didn't live here? Um, I think you know dinosaurs came and went; they're extinct. A lot of animals came and went. There were like huge changes into the environment from volcanoes spewing, from meteors happening, like. Even just the natural world has a lot of environmental effects that change us from an ice age to a non-ice age. You know, like things are just constantly in flux. It's kind of it's kind of strange to be like, no, we shouldn't let anything be in flux anymore. It should stay like how it currently is forever. And that's the ideal state of the world. Um, that that's like a weird way to to think about it because people lived when they were you know, crossing the Bering Strait and <laughs> when the world was Pangea. And, you know, like there's so many different iterations of the world apart from the one that we live in. The point isn't that we don't want the world to change. The point is that we don't want to be harming it, the world that we live in, <laughs> that we want, you know, we want to keep it nice for us and for future humans and for future species, but it's fine for it to change. I think, I think one reason why we sort of focus on these these baselines and we seek to just sort of freeze nature in the stasis because it's actually like politically easy because it's, it's hard to decide as a collective what should this ecosystem look like what's best for humans and the wildlife to live there it's much easier to say let's just pick this this date which sort of makes sense to everybody and try to go back be it like 1492 or or 10,000 bc or any other i think some of that uneasiness that Elle was talking about is just like humans becoming uneasy with our increasing ability to impact the world and our increasing power to like manage nature because if you think about historically like we were just at the whims of mother nature for so long and it kind of I think it feels central to our human nature in some ways and we're slowly 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 getting much better at that and becoming more isolated from the impacts of nature and I think that makes some people uncomfortable we kind of have to come up with a new paradigm of how we relate to the world when we're not just completely at the whims of nature. And how do we, as humans, balance growth economically, structurally with the impacts of the environment? Because a lot of times it's, they seem like they're always going to be at odds. I, I like to, um, I, I think that's a common thought, right? That, that all human economic growth must come at the cost of, of nature. And I think in some ways that's true. I mean, the, the big one's obviously climate change. All the energy we use, um, most of it comes from fossil fuels. And then that causes the emissions, which has all these these bad environment, environmental impacts. But I, I think there's also positive trends that come with growth. One of them I highlighted in, in a recent article of mine is, is land use. So if there's a lot of tech, new technologies um, that actually reduce our, our impact on the land. Um, a big one is agricultural productivity. Um, we've, through, through improved fertilizers and, and chemicals and, and cultivars, we've massively re reduced the amount of land it takes to grow a certain amount of crops. Um, especially in wealthier countries. So that just per capita, e even though we've got all this population growth, um, it's decreased so much per capita that there's a, there's some research that suggests that agricultural land use is actually peaked and is now declining. 
And that's fully because of economic growth. There's a yield, a massive yield gap, I think, um, between like the richest and poorest countries of like two to three times. Um, so if we were able to get poor countries rich, increase those yields, we could spare millions and millions of acres. Like land masses, I think the figure I saw recently was a land mass the size of India. Um, it could be returned to nature. There's like this approximation that I think it was in 2020, seafaring ships stopped burning fossil fuels with sulfur in them um, as they were crossing the ocean. And the thinking was this would reduce pollution. Um, but as it turns out, sulfur <laughs> reflects sunlight. And so what they've come to realize is that the secession of the ships burning sulfur containing fuels actually warmed the North Atlantic by 0.25 degrees Celsius. Um, and some people are saying we need to make, start having our ships burn sulfur again. So it's kind of counterproductive. It's like you in your mind, you think, oh, we shouldn't we shouldn't pollute. But like maybe this was actually like helping in some way. We don't know. I, mean, I think a lot of geoengineering tactics are kind of in a similar vein, but it, it's not necessarily black and white. I feel like our generation has been conditioned to always think that like human impact equals negative environmental impact. And it's kind of fun to collect some of those alternative examples because um, it is true that economic growth sometimes has negative environmental impacts. But like Malcolm said, there's a lot of evidence for the contrary too. So like when I started researching water policy in Utah, I was really surprised to learn that like even as Utah's population has grown, our cities have used less water and we use less water per capita. So like we are getting better at being more efficient with our water use. And then if you think about wildlife crossings, which is another thing that we've been building here in Utah, it's like you wouldn't need a wildlife cro crossing if the city didn't exist. But the fact that we have a city that's prosperous and cares enough about the environment to like build a separate highway for wildlife means that like we're living more harmoniously with nature and like economic growth does not have to mean environmental degradation. Yeah, I agree. And I think what you said about, about uh, the, this, this sort of willingness to pay or, or care for the environment is really important. Like economic growth obviously can have lots of negative impacts. If we're producing more, we have more waste that can create problems. But if you combine this sort of increased capability that economic growth gives you with the increased care for the environment that we do see around the world as people get richer, as they as they sort of can attain their basic needs, they start to care more about the environment. If you combine those two things, you can get um, pretty amazing outcomes. And, and we can accomplish things that we couldn't, we, we just could never accomplish if we were still living like a subsistence agrarian lifestyle. I was actually in a conversation online the other day with somebody and um, I mentioned how great it is that so many countries have banned single use plastics. And he said, well, we don't even need to do that. We should let companies use plastics. And I said, but plastics are such an, an issue. They are turned into microplastics and they go into our ocean and into our food and our waterways and we're eating them and the fish are eating them. And he was like, yeah, but the problem is the waste of plastic, not the development of plastic. And we're already developing things like microbes that eat plastic and make it so there is no plastic anymore and that's just something I would have never even thought of he sent me a bunch of links and I went and read through about all these like microbe <laughs> microbes that eat plastic and I was like well oh my gosh we already do this for so many of our trash we do incineration and we have these other ways of like if you can we need to we can't be thinking of these problems as like black and white this is a necessary harm or this is a necessary like for the environment a lot of times we can make decisions that kind of fall on the same side or as growth mm -hmm. and solution. Yeah. And also governance is so important. I think with the plastic issue, especially like so much plastic waste comes from countries that, that just don't have the, the institutions or the capabilities to collect the waste and store it safely. So it ends up in the ocean. Um, right. So I think equally important, I, I, they're related things, obviously, but equally important to growth is, is good, accountable government um, that, well, if, if there's a pollution problem, people can vote and put and, and put in solutions, right? Yeah, I'm curious actually what you guys think about, um, because there is, I think there is to some extent, some countries are better equipped to make these good decisions that are beneficial for the environment. Maybe other countries aren't as well equipped and thus don't really care. I, I think overall we're seeing as you know, even China is making huge strides uh, that people don't think that they are. But um, I'm curious what you guys think um, 
as far as how we can handle that inequity between countries. I think that's the reason why I'm so passionate about this topic is because if you think about developing countries, it seems really unfair to make them adopt this paradigm that we've sort of unconsciously adopted in the US. So like economic growth is always bad because it harms the environment when people in these countries have lower quality of life and they're just trying to provide a better life for themselves and their families. And we, from the comfort of our homes with heating and electricity and all of that, um, have forced this into such a black and white issue when it isn't really that way. And I just don't want that to be reflected onto developing countries. I think they deserve the chance to have self-determination and to develop their own economies in the way they see, see fit. And like Malcolm said, you know, we as economies experience growth, they tend to then take better care of the environment when they become more wealthy. And also globally, people are becoming more aware of just environmental quality in general. So there are government's practices that I think will be adopted, but I just don't think it's fair to tell nations that they should stop developing because it would be bad for the environment. Yeah. It's also probably not um, practical or feasible, right? Like I, I don't think, um, it's a stable equilibrium to have a bunch of rich countries enforcing rules on a bunch of poor countries. It just seems like a bad idea in the long, like it's geopolitically in the long term. It seems like there is in this conversation, a battle of thought and education and policy around environmentalism. Where do you think assumptions in the past have hurt us and what needs to change going forward? Both, and we can talk about the US, but globally. I think a lot about sort of the history of environmentalism and environmental thought. In the US kind of started with the Green Revolution in the 70s. And a lot of, if you think about the concerns that were brought up then, a lot of them have been proven unfounded. So uh, you can think of like Malthusian concerns about increasing population and the effect on you know global land use, which Malcolm has said, has been proven to not be an issue. We've become so much better agricultural productivity that like we're not wasting more and more land as the population grows. Um, but somehow, despite our incredible successes and the work of people like Norman Borlaug to like usher in those agricultural advancements, people are still kind of stuck on those same concerns, even though we've been living now for 30, 40, 50 years, like living the solutions. And so I don't, I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because environmentalists just like write such dang pretty language, you know? <laughs> I mean, I think it's just the overall doomer mentality that I think is inevitable because of the way our media works. Just like, it's not a good story to be like, we learned how to grow food on let on the same, like, you know, feed the entire population on way less land. Like that's not an exciting story. It's better to you know, tell the story of the one place where it's gotten overrun and there's, you know, we're, we're farming so much meat and in these factories, like that's like a much more juicy story to, to focus on like the bad elements. Um, and it just makes it so that we don't see the larger picture. Like if you were an environmentalist 30 years ago and you were looking at the trends and you, you know, set them out into the future, you'd be like, yeah, this is all going to end badly. Um, and then you just might not have ever seen again, like how things have been updated since then. So you just kind of keep that worldview, but like so much has changed. And I, I mean, every day mm -hmm. I see something come through my inbox being, being like, now we're not even, maybe we're not even going to hit the degrees Celsius that everyone is afraid that we're going to hit because of how things have already changed. And in fact, maybe that if we hit that number, it's not going to be as bad as we all think. And it's we're constantly updating our data and so it is hard to be on top of I will say even as somebody who writes about this topic I struggle to stay on top with all all the way things are changing all the time so I get why if you weren't writing about this topic and you're just a reader and you read one article 10 years ago that could like drastically affect your worldview for kind of ever but I think it's just hard to um, reset that unless you're constantly you know reading the updates I also think we're sort of at the beginning of a really, um, of an actual, of a very wonderful time in environmental history. I think, I think, I mean, there's still tons of challenges. Like the, the extinction rates are, are much higher than they were before 1800 still. A lot of species are going extinct. Um, there's real challenges we have to solve, but there's so many amazing things happening 
that are sort of just beginning. Like like I mentioned, the we're sort of um, peaking in agricultural land use. That's a huge one. But also these conservation technologies, like we have the ability now to to go into a, a river and take some water, and then sift through the fragments of DNA and figure out all the animals that live in the area. So there's massive increase in our surveillance capabilities. We have satellites that can accurately measure forest cover. Um, so I, I just think we have all these tools now in our in our toolbox to to halt extinction and protect nature that we didn't have uh, a few decades a few decades ago. Um, so I think as, as long as we sort of maintain um, some sort of strong desire for stewardship, there's there's so much we can do. And and the key thing is having sex as wealth to to pay professionals to devote their lives to these problems and to um, and fund programs that can that can do these amazing things. I think that's a challenge when we talk about language and you mentioned Malcolm about funding. A lot of times it's easier to fundraise when it's, Hey, the sky's falling down. Uh, how do we change that rhetoric from we need to invest in this because we're not going to be able to breathe in 20 years versus, Hey, we can actually change it. I would love to see like a more solutions oriented literature because like Malcolm said, there are so many technologies. We just released a paper at the CGO two days ago about using CRISPR gene editing technology to help species have better resilience, um, which is like super cool. And there's so many examples of humans using technology for the good of the environment. But yeah, I think Ella's right. The media landscape is kind of naturally biased towards the negative stories. One successful example of like positive climate communications I've seen recently is um, Robin Wall Kimmer's Braiding Sweetgrass book, which was super popular for the last few years. And even among like the, what I would say, like the more normally like doom scrolling crowd, like people who are concerned about climate change and like think that everything is doomed. And I think she was just the perfect representative to communicate a message of optimism. She's an ecology professor and she's also um, a Native American. And she talks about sort of like how, you know, her education and science helped her appreciate nature and also her traditional background. So I think just more people providing their personal stories sort of in the similar vein of like traditional 19th, 1970s environmentalism. If you think about like all the books that grabbed the American psyche, like Edward Abbey, he was talking about his personal experiences with the land. And I think we need more of that from people who are optimistic as well. I do think this is a great place for fiction, bias a little bit, but um, I do think, you know, in the 1960s, we had a lot of optimistic sci-fi. It was like, you know, space colonies and rockets and all these incredible things we could do with technology. And then I don't know what happened if the sci-fi writers started getting freaked out by the things that we could also do with technology. And then they just started taking an insanely dystopian turn um but i think that um i do think that people are starting to be fed up with the dystopian mindset um and we're starting to see even just like you know more silly positive meeting like like ted lasso and things where it's like we don't want to sit here and watch like this drudgery hour-long dark thing all the time we need something that kind of lifts it um so i do think that there is this if we could, you know, get more sci-fi writers, whether it's film or book or whatever, to imagine how these technologies could be used for good. I think that's kind of the hope of solar punk, but I think that's an uh, optimistic genre right now and doesn't actually exist. I, I haven't seen very many books in that category. Um, but the idea being, you know, that Mary Shelley using electricity to arouse Frankenstein's monster, you know, that inspired the defibrillator. You have the, you know, the submarine was invented in sci-fi before it was invented in real life. So I think that if we can stop focusing on like all the ways the world are going to end and stop fo start focusing on like, here are some great inventions that we could use in the future that's really forward thinking, then that just pushes us all in that direction, including the people, the technologists that are actually building it. Yeah. And it goes back to the yeah. black and white thinking of dystopian fiction where and we mentioned The Last of Us actually on a previous symposium, but The Last of Us shows in a zombie apocalypse while the earth is taking over the city of Boston and look how peaceful it is and beautiful it is. And there's deer and look at the landscape. So th that that thinking is embedded through all of that dystopian fiction because it's the black and white of like, if we remove more humans, the earth will be better. 
I always find that idea sort of uh, ironic because in, in my view, if you take a very long-term view, with, without humans, the earth is basically a tomb where everything is doomed to eventually go extinct and die. Um, so it, it might, it, I don't know, people, this is, I guess it's sort of a fringe idea of mine. People might, might disagree, but but I think when we look at uh, nature, we see what you described, like this uh, bucolic garden um, where everything is in harmony. But I don't know, I, I don't really buy that. Um, extinction is inevitable for pretty much every species. 99% of all species that have, have lived have gone extinct. Um, all sorts of atrocities happen in nature all the time, um, especially in the insect world. Absolutely horrible things happen to insects all the time. Like you can see videos on Twitter of, of praying mantises infected with these worms that are like three times the size of their body. Um, they turn them into mindless zombies. Wasps will lay their eggs and cockroaches like in the movie Alien and they'll, they'll burst out. Uh, it's truly horrifying. So I, I um, that's not to say we should we should try to police nature, but we shouldn't see, I don't think we should see nature as this bucolic wonderland without humans. Um, and we also should see humans like sort of like the ultimate conservation tool. Humans are the only ones that take species and, and make sure they survive uh, for as long as possible. We're the ones who can stack up genetic diversity in, in different ways. We're the, the ones who can see life throughout the, throughout the cosmos. I just think that it's, it's sort of, it's very short-sighted uh, to see humans as, as the ultimate enemy of, of nature. Why do we care as humans about other species and about the environment? Well, why do we, or, or why should we? Both. Why is it in our nature to care about nature? That I don't know, but I think it's a very beautiful thing that we do. I think it's rare among, among animals to have this sort of selfless desire to protect other species. I agree. And I think it's not something that like can be philosophized and just like explained. It's just like, you feel it, you know, you spend time in beautiful nature. Elle and I live in Utah. And when you grow up with that, you just kind of have a background appreciation for nature. And I think spending time in nature makes you want to protect it. If you're a part of some religion, you have some way of finding peace and some ritual, some devotion. Um, if you're not religious, what is the thing that most people say brings them peace and devotion? They always say going out into nature. Oh, going out into nature clears my head. Oh, it makes me feel good and at peace again. So I think there is, I think there is something to being out in nature and being connected to that, that feels, um, maybe spiritual is not the right word, but like just makes us feel connected and, and, and calmed in some way. So I think it's maybe natural, natural to think nature is, is good. <laughs> Thank you, Al. I appreciate you bringing it back to that, that dad pun that I, that I had. Uh, <laughs> why should environmentalists be pro-growth? Um, we meant talked about a little bit, but how is that progress important and why, and how can people come together? Because I feel like there is a lot of division between economists and capitalists and environmentalists. It seems like there's a huge gap and that might be my perception, but how can they come together around the idea of pro-growth? Well, I think there's a sort of dark uh, counterfactual to degrowth. Um, I think a lot of people who advocate for degrowth imagine sort of us retreating into into this like almost this pastoral vision of you know uh, trading lightly on the earth, um, zero waste lifestyles, circular economies. But I'm not sure if that's how it would look in reality. Um, I I just I, th I think if you if you have societies where there's no economic growth, um, things become more zero sum. People don't have confidence that life's going to improve, and so they might you know turn to violence more often. Um, they might become very pessimistic and and lose hope for the future. And um, I think above all, they are going to resent the people who are telling them that they can't grow. Um, they can't expect higher wages in the future. And, and we also see that um, in countries that, that sort of see real degrowth, like economies that become smaller, um, terrible things happen to the environment, like increases in poaching. People will go slaughter all the zoo animals. I just think that these uh, degrowthers underrate um, sort of what happens to our priorities. Like this love of nature we were just talking about that's so natural, 
I don't know how natural it is. I think it might disappear as soon as you're hungry. I don't know what's the best way to bridge that divide, but I agree that there is a very significant divide between economists and environmentalists. And I also agree with Malcolm. Like, I think that environmentalists, even those who are degrowth, like, they have good intentions, but I just don't think good intentions are enough. You have to actually grapple with reality. And the fact is, like, most people who are pro degrowth are living in the most advanced economies. And maybe they don't use a car to get around because they like really care about making, you know, their lives eco-friendly, but they probably use a washing machine. You know, like where is the point where degrowth is too much? Everybody has a point. And I'm not sure that I want to leave into the hands of degrowthers to decide that for everybody. But I do think I do think economists could do a better job maybe of not like being so like adamantly opposed to these ideas, I think they could do a better job of instead of just shooting them down, talking about why economists view economic growth as almost like a moral imperative, why they think it that human progress is important. And then also talk about these examples that Malcolm highlighted that like, uh, we can use economic growth to also protect the environment. It doesn't have to be zero sum. Yeah, and I'd add that economists, um, I mean, I'm not an economist, so, um, you know, I'm not an expert in this exactly, but I think that they do propose lots of solutions that that seem realistic for environmental problems. Like they recognize negative externalities, and and will often advocate for taxing them and then and using that money to to reverse them. Things like air pollution. Like if you if you're polluting the air, you should pay a fee, and that should go to to something else, some some public good. And so maybe if economists talk more about that, you can say that growth is good, explain why, and then and then offer these sort of rational. Um, economic solutions yeah that's a good point i don't know anybody who like <laughs> i don't know any economists that are pro-pollution you know even if there's if they're pretty anti-regulation in general like yeah they support like environmental quality standards and like nobody's trying to repeal the clean air and clean water acts so maybe finding common ground where they can and i mean to the degrowthers point i don't think we need unlimited growth i don't like i don't think it's just like, oh, we need to keep going forever and really pollute the earth and have flying cars. And it just, we've destroyed everything in the process of having all these crazy technologies. Like, I don't think that's the goal. I think the goal is develop all the rest of the countries that still haven't grown at all to some, you know, some standard of living. Um, and then make sure we can kind of keep that up worldwide from there. And I, you know, we're already figuring out how to use less environmental resources to do that growth in, in countries that are already developed, as we've talked about, they don't need as many environmental resources. Um, and that might, I mean, if we develop nuclear fusion, then we won't even, then we'll just have unlimited energy and we won't be harming the environment at all. So I think that there are, like, we have to realize that like, I, I don't think we're just going to go straight to developing flying cars unless we've achieved some level of energy abundance that makes it so that that's not harmful to the to the earth. Um, I, I think one thing I heard was really interesting. Um, I was at a event where I was listening to the CEO of Netflix talk about their growth strategy. And this was like two, uh, this was pre pandemic. So let's say 2020. And he was saying, he's like, oh, it's so great. We have the maximum number of subscribers that you can possibly have. It's not like we can really grow our subscriber rate from here. So now from now on, all we're focused on is having the best movies. So we're just focusing on making the quality of our content better. Um, and I was like, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Cause then the growth isn't coming from more money, more people, more, it's just coming from making something better. Um, of course, then what happens two years later, the shareholders did want some <laughs> growth uh, financially. And so they decided to introduce advertising into movies. But um, I do think that his his original thesis is correct. It's like, once we get to a level where everything is super great and we're as grown as we need to be worldwide, like from there, it's just incrementally making things better. And we don't need to, you know, we don't need to cause a lot of harm to do that. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I also think there's sort of like a natural, inevitable form of degrowth that's going to happen. If I mean, unless something changes where population growth is, is really slowing down in, in the wealthy in wealthy countries and even in, in poor countries too. Um, and so you've, you've aging populations. And, and also I feel like people in my generation, especially uh, just don't really want to work that much. I think I mean, you're going to see a lot of people just, you know, taking fewer hours instead of a raise. 
um, which obviously that's a, a sort of degrowth trend. So I'm, I think humanity might come to that point voluntarily where we say we actually have enough. I, I don't want to work 40 hours anymore. I, I want to work 20, um, take my same salary and spend time with my kids, with my one, one child that I had. I have to put on my economist hat and defend them just a little bit. I think um, a common misconception about economic growth is that it comes from like consumption. If you, I remember like following the 2008 financial crisis, like watching the news when it was on and my parents were watching it. And I would see news anchors who would say like, oh, consumer spending was up this quarter. So the economy is growing. And I think that's how normal people think about economic growth. But that is very different than how economists thinking about growth. For economists, it's like the growth in ideas. New ideas are where economic growth comes from. It's not just consumption. It's like, how do we actually produce more wealth, happiness, not even like material goods, just how do we get better at creating things using less intensive resources? I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. That just, that kind of blew my mind there, Jennifer. Thank you for sharing <laughs> that. Um, retail is only 16% of our economy. And everybody always thinks about retail as if, as if like that's the, I mean, you see it used all the time as consumption, materialism, as if if that's what's the whole economy and destroying everything. But it's actually a kind of small portion. Another aspect of economics or financial challenges that we see with the environment is natural disasters. We mentioned it a little bit earlier. I've seen those get a lot of play on the news how do we move forward where there's an assumption that well, there will be worse natural disasters that Miami will be under, uh, you know, feet of water in, in 10 years? How do, as governments and societies, we balance out the challenges of that? Yes, you, if you're in a hurricane zone, you're probably going to hit a hurricane, um, but also people want that Miami Beach house. Not me. I'm just in general. It seems like people <laughs> like, still are buying property there. I hate that argument so much because it's like, oh my god, like I remember looking at the National Geographic. They made a bunch of maps and it was like, this is what the world would look like if all of the polarized caps melt. And it was like, okay, Florida's gone and like some coastline. <laughs> and I was just like, okay, and this is gonna happen so slowly that like we all have time to move away from the beaches. And by the way, the people that are like on the on the beach, on the beach are like probably more wealthy and can probably move. And if you're not, if you're in a place that's like upheld by a Delta or something like New Orleans style, like we as a government can incentivize and help people to relocate. I like don't, I don't, moving has been a function of humanity forever. We have like moved for weather forever since the dawn of humanity. So it's like hard for me to be like, well, now, now we should all stay where we are. And if you, if you're by the ocean, we should just keep building up sandbags and dikes and make sure that the water never gets you. It's like, well, the, the world is going to change and people are going to need to move. And this is in fact, my number one criticism of Kim Stanley Robinson's book, the ministry for the future, the whole book just imagines everybody stays in one place. And when the world gets too hot, like all of India is just screwed. Um, and you're just like, well, if the other countries would have let them in, this wouldn't have been an issue. Like why is everybody congregated where it's the most hot? Like, Literally, if we could just allow more movement by opening borders, by, you know, like saying, okay, in Kim, in Kim Stanley Robinson's book, he does have one point where like one character says, but Canada is great now. It's like, oh, a great place to live. Siberia is a great place to live. And he's like, yeah, but now the ice road truckers can't cross the ice rivers. And I was like, what? But now there's rivers and you can build bridges and people can live there. Like if we we should be we should be setting our societies up to enable movement not like trying to make it so that people can stay in one place sorry yeah. that was I, oh that was, that was good <laughs> yeah. i was gonna say ice road trekkers is Elle's next thing she's going after it was the postal service in the last episode and uh, now <laughs> ice road truckers watch out well i, I think that's totally right Elle. i mean i think um if there's one thing you can i mean this is just not even related to, to the climate change but I mean, allowing immigration from the developing world is, is probably the number one thing you can do um, for just economic justice in general. I don't know if that's a good term for it. 
Um, but but I also I, I don't know I push back a little bit on on your possibility to staying in one place. I think not that it's a bad idea to move, but that I think it's probably not that hard to save Miami or other big metro areas um, through adaptation. I mean, historically, we, I think we we raised Chicago several feet, like the entire city, block by block. Um, yeah, and move the river, the flow of the river. Yeah, so I think that was all a while ago. Possible. Yeah, yeah. So I think the high value metro area. I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, necessarily. And we have ways to build stronger buildings and adapt to, um, to natural disasters. Um, but obviously, yeah, make, I, I totally agree that, that reducing friction and, and making it easier to develop new areas is also key because maybe you just don't want to live in Miami anymore. It's just too hot and too windy, even if it still exists. I feel like I haven't mentioned enough in my own newsletter that I probably want to talk about at some point, but I've talked a lot about like what governments I feel are doing it have doing various utopian things in the world right now um but one thing that's never talked about is okay but if I was going to choose somewhere to move where would I move would it be the country with the most utopian government because honestly I'd probably rather live in Mexico City than live in Helsinki <laughs> so and that's because of the weather and because it's mm -hmm. nice there and there's a good culture and there's you know it, it's um you know that's I think weather plays a, a big role in what people wanting to move places. So if if a place is too hot or too cold, then people should be able to move to another area. Being somebody who grew up around Lake Michigan and my entire childhood, there was always kind of this whether it was a, a old widow's tale or had reality that Texas is going to build a pipeline and suck the water from Lake Michigan or things like that were going to happen. Or like people in Arizona are going to start shipping Lake Michigan water down there because they live in a desert. What 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 positive futures of like living in those environments are are they? I guess what I want to ask is is it is it re, is it a reality to live in a place like Arizona if it's going to get up to 130 Fahrenheit temperatures in the summer? I love this question because Phoenix is absolutely a testament to man's hubris, but it's also awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and, Thank uh, you. Yeah, and uh, it's funny. I've never heard people like uh, from Lake Michigan concerned about Arizona taking their water because I live in it, Utah it, and we all. It share might just be me. River. It might just be me. Yeah, no, I hear that too. Like there were uh, Utah lawmakers who were talking about the idea of like creating a pipeline to ship water from the Pacific Ocean to Utah. So um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like water is an important issue in deserts, and this is actually why I focus so much on energy abundance, is because we right now. We, I always get the statistic wrong, but it's like 0.5 or 0.05% of Earth's fresh water, like of Earth's water is what we use as humans. So there's tons of water available on Earth. We just haven't figured out a way to make it usable to us. But if we had energy abundance through nuclear fusion or just, you know, nuclear fission or whatever, then we would be able to come up with cost effective ways to do desalination or other water management techniques that would make these civilizations like in deserts sustainable long-term, even if they continue growing at like a huge pace. That's helpful. That, that calms my nerves a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Another helpful thing about water is so, like I said earlier, populations like in the desert states, like Utah and Arizona are growing. They're among the fastest growing states in the nation, but cities like Salt Lake city and Las Vegas have actually reduced their water usage, even as their population has been growing. And it's actually like agricultural water use that is the majority of water use in the Western US. So if we can just continue to have agricultural improvements, then in some places it's like 80% of water use goes there. So like then we immediately have more supply, even if we don't figure out how to do desalination. Interesting. So it's not necessarily like I'm taking a 10 to 15 minute shower versus a two minute shower. It's those big movers like agriculture. That's okay. yes, yes, absolutely. Like I'm all for, you know, personal responsibility and being efficient where you can. But yeah, you taking a 20 minute shower is not what's causing, you know, horrification. You're, you're just fine. Take the shower. Okay, I have to go to, <laughs> that's where my best ideas are. All right. I want to, we talked about some examples, uh, like positive examples that are happening for pro-growth environmentalism, but can you all share some more examples or even like reading, reading recommendations for folks that want to learn more about this aspect and hear more positive ideas like we're talking about today? Well, I recently found a great Substack blog called the weekly Anthropocene. It's pretty well known. So the viewers might, might already know about that, but uh, this guy, Sam um, compiles this 
huge list of, of very hopeful um, pro growth stories about you know, renewable energy development, innovation, conservation success stories. So that's a great source for a environmental white pill. Yeah, I would add um, our world and data does a really good job of putting together data and charts about um, all sorts of statistics of economic growth and energy use, but they're a really fantastic source. And then also the two books that I mentioned, Emma Maris's Rambunctious Garden, if you're kind of interested in the idea and like the history of environmental thought, and how humans can like be a positive part of that going forward. And then I feel like everybody knows it, but Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass is really just like a fantastic book. Um, and I would just add um, Future Crunch is my favorite newsletter. And they just list all the good news from the web um, on a daily basis. And they all have an environmental section and he'll always go into you know, here's where we've seen CO2 adjustments. Here's where land is getting protected. Here's where water is getting protected. Here's where dark skies are getting protected. And here's like all the things humans are doing to protect the environment because we never, we never, never see those in the news, but it exists very much. I really like the idea of like actively seeking out the positive stories just to kind of counter the negative media bias, because it's one thing that I like about my generation is like we, um, we care about climate change and we care about the environment. And I just don't want us to get stuck thinking that everything is terrible. So uh, if the media isn't going to do that for us, I think it's worth just being curious and like looking for solutions and having a little bit of faith in human ingenuity. Yeah, I think I even just talking to you both, I feel a lot differently than I did an hour ago because I get stuck in that cycle of negativity. And I think a lot of people just become passive going back to the idea that, well, I just need to make sure that I have food on the table tonight. And I think that's what I've seen. A lot of people are forced into that around the world, but I think folks like me, that's my tendency is just to like retreat. Why, why do you think it's important to not do that, to not do my instinct of just retreating and just focusing on myself? I guess I would push back on that and say, you're, you're welcome to retreat if you want to, because the, like there are people that are thinking these through and are actively working towards making this better. I think that um, if you can do something great, but like, I I think it does cause paralysis to make people feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do and the world is, is dying. But, but if you can just read some books, I mean, um, Enlightenment Now by Steven Pinker is one of my favorites. It just shows you that we are absolutely heading in a progress direction. We are not regressing. And, um, and that these things, we are working on these things. We are actively working on having, you know, using less of the environment, even as we grow the economy. Like, it's not like nothing will get done unless you do something. Um, we are like, we are fixing the problems as we realize what the problems are. So I, I think, I think there's a big problem in the U.S. with us um, thinking that our politicians and who they are is synonymous with what kind of progress we can make and our politicians all seem like a shit show so it just seems like it's like a reality tv show and nobody's doing anything but it's they're not they might help with some policy but there are major thinkers behind the scenes that are influencing that policy and like actually getting things done so it's not like if we just sit back and let the politicians do their thing it's all going to go to hell in a handbasket like there are very important thinkers working on these problems and they are making huge progress. I also, I think if, if uh, it makes you feel better to get personally involved, there's, I think you should focus on your local area. Like, I think it's really awesome. All these trends about people wilding their front yards, um, you know, building butterfly gardens. Like that sounds sort of, sort of uh, minor and silly, but I think that's, I think it's an amazing uh, cultural movement. Um, and it's, and, and it's going to help because you're going to see the difference in your own yard. You're going to see butterflies landing on your porch um just focus on that and I, and I don't think i don't think it's healthy to worry about every little thing like you said about like the shower or the shopping bag um i say just hold politicians accountable when there's low-hanging fruit like if it's a poor waste management situation hold them accountable and and focus on improving the landscape and the biodiversity in your community and that's that's enough yeah i absolutely agree i don't think you should be feeling guilty about you know personal actions because these are societal scale problems We've got a lot of smart people working on it. It's great to be personally responsible, but I do think like, yeah, if you feel that paralyzation, 
find something in your local community that you can contribute to and you'll immediately feel better. There's lots of really cool um, crowdsourcing conservation projects. I think it's called citizenscience.org, but like literally you can just like identify where species are in your neighborhood and it helps scientists learn how to protect them better. So there's simple things that you can do, but yeah, the weight of the world should not be on your shoulders. I, I naturalist, download iNaturalist or Seek, and then you can just take pictures yeah. of stuff on your phone identify it and then that data goes to conservationists so they can track species movement is awesome so download that from the app store and use it i feel like i've been just a part of a environmental therapy session so thank <laughs> you all for helping me not feel worse about myself uh that's that's very kind of, maybe i'm not the only one maybe listeners and viewers feel that same way but i appreciate you all thinking through that um as as we close here, uh, I want to know more about how we can read your work and and follow what you're doing. So, Malcolm, how can people connect with what you're doing uh, every day? Sure. So, I think the best way is to subscribe to my Substack, which is uh, Antheros at Substack.com. Jennifer, how can folks find your work? Substack is also probably the best way for me, and it's just my name, Jennifer Morales at Substack.com. And Al, how can people follow your work? just elysian.press, which is also Substack. I have to close because we have a Malcolm on the call that has been very enlightening to me. But um, if you are also reading things, um, there's a film called Jurassic Park, and there's a character right here that called Dr. Ian Malcolm, who's been helping me get through these big topics with, with environmentalism. And he has a line in the film that says, life finds a way. And that's given me a lot of peace. <laughs> So uh, thank you to Malcolm and Jennifer and Elle, of course. And thank you all for listening and watching. And we'll be back again for another Lesion Symposium.